fortunate enough to have Gail Patricelli here from the University of California, Davis, to talk about uh, you know what she's researched, what she's found out with these these amazing birds in New Guinea, bower birds. So here she is. Thanks a lot. of natural selection is very powerful in explaining traits like camouflage coloration, as you see in this fish and this insect, <laughs> and in this female ptarmigan in fall and winter plumage. And of course, the theory explains how this characteristic, this trait, helps animals to stay alive by avoiding predators. But Darwin's theory of natural selection alone has a more difficult time explaining animals like the peacock, where elaborate male traits and behaviors seem to make the male an easy target for predators. And this was such a problem for Darwin early on that he wrote in a letter to a friend that the mere sight of a peacock's tail made him sick. <laughs> he was a sickly guy, so this was a pretty typical state of affairs for, for Darwin. But uh, like many things, Darwin himself provided the solution to this problem, which is his theory of sexual selection, which proposes that these elaborate display traits aid in reproduction and that the genes for these traits therefore spread in the population. And one way that these traits can aid in reproduction is by female choice, when females prefer to mate with the most ornamented of males. So in peafowl, there's evidence that females prefer to mate with the males that have the most eye spots on their tails. But in peafowl and in many other species, um, especially the ones I'll be talking to you about today, the, uh, the bowerbirds, uh, males don't provide parental care. So females aren't uh, choosing a better parent, a co-parent, to help raise their young together. All she's really gaining from the male when she mates with him is sperm. So why then does she bother assessing the eye spots on his tail or any other display trait that he produces? So females may assess male display traits because they convey information about genetic or direct benefits that the female may gain from her mate choice. And there are a number of types of benefits that have been proposed. Genetic benefits means uh, acquiring better genes for their offspring. And these can be genes, for example, that encode for a better immune system function. This is often referred to as the good genes hypothesis. Or genes that encode for sexier display traits in her male offspring. This is often called a sexy son or a runaway sexual selection <laughs> hypothesis. <laughs> and there's also direct benefits. These are uh, benefits that directly increase female fecundity or offspring survival. And so for these in, in peak fowl or in bowerbirds, this may mean avoiding parasite transmission during copulation. STDs. An alternative hypothesis is that females are assessing male display traits and they're choosy because they are simply being manipulated by the male's dazzling sexiness. So basically the males are evolving traits that just tap into the female sensory system and make the males <coughs> utterly irresistible to breed. So there are a number of reasons why females may be choosy about their mates. But courtship doesn't just involve the male sort of unfurling his tail for a passively observing female. Uh, courtships are often elaborate and dynamic, involving interaction between the male and the female, and they're often more like a negotiation than an advertisement. And you can see this in a diversity of species here. And in these courtships, males must choose a location for courtship. They need to choose and approach a female without scaring her away. They need to interact appropriately in these counterpositioning, chasing events that often happen during courtship. And they need to produce their most attractive display trait, given what might be variation among females and their preferences, and also the market context, what other males are offering. <laughs> <laughs> and these are all complex tasks, and not all males do them equally well. And we see this when we study animal courtship in the wild. We often see this with have a male with a great song, great dance, beautiful color patch. But every time he tries to approach a female, he barrels right up to her and scares her away before he can get the chance to show it off. We see these kinds of behaviors in natural populations. So Darwin's process of sexual selection may favor not just the evolution of these elaborate traits like the peacock's tail, but also what we can call social skills, the ability to approach and interact uh, with the opposite sex. And too few studies have examined these social skills because they're very difficult to measure. They involve interaction between two different partners that have complex behaviors. And so they, be, they become very difficult to measure. And in order to measure them, we need controlled experiments where we hold one side of the interaction constant and measure the response of the other party. And so today I'll tell you about an experiment where I tried to do just that. 
in a fantastic study organism, the satin bowerbird. So bowerbirds are found in Australia, along the eastern coast of Australia, where the satin bowerbirds are. Many of them are found in New Guinea, the ones that I'll be talking to you about a little bit later. So uh, my study site was a beautiful rainforest, eucalyptus forest valley called Wallaby Creek along the eastern coast. It was an absolutely beautiful place to do, to do this research, despite that we had to live in this um, primitive shack with no running water or power for up to six months at a time. It's a beautiful place to work. And the focus of this work uh, was understanding the satin bowerbird. So this is the satin bowerbird. This is the male satin bowerbird. And bowerbirds build bowers. So this is the bower here, this two-walled structure built out of sticks with a platform of sticks out in front. And that's where males place their bower decorations. And you can see that in this particular species, the satin bowerbirds, males love the color blue. And they use uh, lots of yellow leaves and flowers as, as highlights. So when there are no humans around, that means lots of parrot feathers and uh, flowers and berries. But when there are people around, you see lots of blue plastic straws and ballpoint pens. They regularly <laughs> broke into our research cabin and stole all of the blue toothbrushes. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite decorations that I found on a bower was a blue baby's pacifier. So I'm sort of imagining the male plucking it out of the mouth. <laughs> So males build bowers, and during the breeding season, females assess male display traits. So they fly around the valley, they visit multiple males in their bowers, they'll stand between the walls of the bowers, and the male puts on a song and dance for the female. <laughs> and they assess male display traits. And there are a number of display traits that are correlated with male mating success. So this, this tells us that these are likely the traits that females are using to select their mates. Females prefer a symmetrical, well-built bower, and in fact, the same types of bowers that we find attractive are the ones that female bowerbirds tend to find attractive. They prefer males that have more blue decorations, that perform a very vigorous and intense song and dance, and I'll show you the, a video of that in just a moment, and that perform high quality renditions of vocal mimicry of local species, and you'll get to hear that in the video clip in just a moment. So females assess multiple male display traits when making their uh, mate <coughs> decisions. There's no male parental care, so males don't help raising the young, so after the female decides who she wants to mate with, copulation happens inside the bower, the female flies away to her own nest, takes care of the young entirely on her own. And that leaves males free to continue courting as many females as possible, but only a few males are successful. So in our study population, our top guy mated with 27 different females during the seven week breeding season. And he did that year after year after year. So the genetic payoff, the evolutionary payoff to being one of these guys is, is very large. And that's why there's such, such strong selection um, to be this, these attractive guys. So what happens during courtship? Courtship involves intense displays performed by the males. So these are video stills. The female is standing between the walls of the bower. The male's puffed up. Uh, he often dances with some yellow leaves in his beak, um, as you can see right here. And he flings his wings out, makes a buzzing sound, and runs across the bower platform. You know, sorry, courtship. And these intense displays are actually quite similar to aggressive displays. So when a male's trying to intimidate another male to get some food, he'll do the same display that he directs towards females during courtship. So they seem a little bit silly to us, but in fact, they're apparently intimidating to another bowerbird. And there's evidence that females prefer more intense and vigorous male displays, but they're also often startled by these displays. <laughs> so um, and they'll sometimes even fly away from the bower during courtship. So males are in a bit of a bind here. They need to display intensely to be attractive, but the same displays may scare females away if he's basically too intense before she's actually ready. <laughs> So what are females doing during courtship? Females are crouching. So in most courtships, even weeks before they're actually ready to mate with anybody, in most courtships, females are crouching slowly downwards. And we noticed in studying this behavior that as females crouch lower down, they're less likely to be startled uh, by the male display. So there's information there in this crouching <laughs> signal, which is a very exaggerated behavior that the females perform. So clever males then, clever males could observe that female signal and adjust their display intensity to avoid threatening females, basically performing their most intense displays when females are crouching and are least likely to be threatened by them. So this is basically our hypothesis, and to test this hypothesis, we needed to manipulate this female signal 
and measure male response. And to do that, I built a robotic female bowerbird. And you might be thinking this doesn't look anything like a bowerbird, and you're, you're right. I put that inside of a real female bowerbird skin in a state-of-the-art robot fabrication facility in our shack. <laughs> and this is the finished fembot. So we placed the fembot inside of a bower where the male would naturally be courting females. So we went out to the male's bower in a wild population, placed the robot in the bower, then I took the remote control, hid in a blind, and could control her behavior. And so we tested males uh, with various rates of female crouching to see how they would respond. So I'll show you a quick video clip here. And the first little clip is to just give you an idea of some of the um, troubleshooting we had to do to get this thing to work. shells. 
And I'll show you a quick video clip here. This is kind of ugly footage. These are all very old tapes. So I apologize for the quality, but you'll be able to see what's going on once I, once I start the video. So this is the little infrared beam that triggers the camera. And this is all video, by the way, that was collected by my dissertation advisor, Jerry Borgia, from the University of Maryland, who was a collaborator on the work that I told you about earlier. So here's the bower right here. There's the male. You'll see the female enter from uh, the back side of the bower. And here are his decorations. And during courtship, you'll see the male performing a song, which is not quite as melodic as the song uh, performed by the satin bower bird. And he presents the crest on his head to the female through the front of the bower, as well as a decoration that he holds in his beak. And he moves back and forth along the side of the bower, each time getting a little bit closer to the back side of the bower until he attempts to mate. So this is a very uh, shortened version of a very long courtship. Hmm. interacting. 
Oops. So this is the male, this is the female. The male performs amazing vocal mimicry. These are all sounds he's producing. The female seems to lead in this counter positioning game. flashes of orange on either side of that central pole. It's an interesting question. And of course, there's a diversity of definitions of art. Um, this is just a simple definition that shares many of the characteristics of other definitions I found. The use of skill and imagination in the creation of aesthetic objects, environments, or experiences that can be shared with others. So the creation of aesthetic works that can be shared with others. And absolutely by this definition, then, Bowerbirds are indeed producing art. And theirs is a performance art. Males are interacting with the works that they produce, and they're interacting with the audience during the performance. <laughs> and I think that asking a question like this can be very helpful for us humans in understanding the evolution of our own aesthetic sense and our relationship to the creatures around us, certainly, um, which is one of the goals of the event today. But is placing other animals into human categories like art or not art helpful for us biologists as we're trying to understand sexually selective traits? And I think the answer is yes. Examining animal produced art or even bodily traits. So for example, these uh, are two other species of bowerbirds. This is the flame bowerbird and the region bowerbird, both of whom have absolutely spectacular plumage. So in that case, they're born to be beautiful. They're not producing these plumage traits in the same way that they produce a bower or decorations. In this case, you would say that the artist, arguably, is the female who has, by, by selection, over long generations in time, been uh, creating and shaping these, um, these beautiful males. So by looking at these traits with an artist's eyes, it certainly can lead to new insights into our shared aesthetics. And exploring this idea is another of our goals today. But it is important to do so cautiously. So we need to be careful. Um, and consider what uh, Jakob van Uxkel, one of the early founders of the field of animal behavior, called the Umwelt, uh, 
or sensory world of the animal, the sensory and cognitive world of the animal. Non-human animals may view the world with very different sensory systems. We may see, smell, and hear things very differently than uh, non-human animals. They can often see colors that we can't see, or they're unable to see colors that we can see. And they may process this information very differently with their different cognitive machinery. So viewing them entirely through the lens of our own experience can, in some case, be misleading, and it requires caution. It's worth doing, but it just simply requires caution. So I believe that our goal should be to see this beauty through the eye of the beholder, when possible, in trying to understand it as a biologist. And I'm just going to briefly tell you about the work of one of my students, Jessica Yuzinski, who is trying to do this, trying to gain a little window into the umwelt of the peafowl, one of this, this iconic species that, that so bedeviled uh, Charles Darwin long ago. And uh, to do that, she has built an eye tracking system, which she trains the females to wear as they're assessing males performing their display. So here's a female wearing a backpack and an eye tracker, <laughs> wandering around through displaying males. And this allows us to basically see what the female is looking at as she's assessing a male and making a decision. And the results are quite surprising. So these plots here show gaze paths of three different females as they're assessing male traits. And as I told you earlier, there is evidence from studies of various populations that females prefer males with more eye spots on their tails. And yet females are rarely gazing at the upper portions of male trains. You've all seen Peacock's display. It's an absolutely spectacular, enormous display. And yet females spend all of their time, almost all of their time, <coughs> gazing along the lower portions of the train back and forth from <coughs> the male's body. And I'm highlighting this just to bring up the point that animals may assess and gather information from the world in a very different way than we do. I'd imagine that if you put an eye tracker on a human and ask them to look at a peacock's train, we would do it in a very, very different way, certainly assessing the entire train in its, in its, um, in its complete glory. And so, <clears throat> this is one reason why scientists tend to be very reticent to use human categories like art and not art to describe animal behaviors. Though, as I said, I think the interface of our sensory worlds is certainly worth exploring. And ultimately, we're trying to answer the question of what sensory and cognitive processes underlie this shared aesthetic sense across animals and how this might favor such astonishing beauty that we find in a peacock's tail in bird songs and colors and bowers and decorations. And we're a long way from answering this question even in such an iconic species as the peacock. So there's a great deal of exciting work left to be done. And I'll leave you with an image of my latest love. This is the greater sage grouse. This is a male performing a display for a female who doesn't seem all that interested. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm flying out tomorrow to Wyoming to stalk these guys throughout their breeding season. And I have a robotic female sage grouse as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I also want to leave you with a quote from Marie Curie. I am among those who think that science has great beauty. A scientist in his laboratory is not only a technician, he is also a child placed before natural phenomena which impress him like a fairy tale. And I bring this up because I think the scientific approach to something uh, like beauty can often seem quite sterile and detached, but I think when you, um, when you see the scientists presenting their work to you today, you'll see that in fact we're all a lot like giddy children, in awe of the beauty that we see in the natural world, and at our own good fortune in getting, getting to study it. So, thank you. tribes in New Guinea are often adorning themselves with the feathers collected from birds of paradise, um, and at, they are absolutely spectacular displays. Um, they, they arrange them around their face and on various parts of their body and end up looking a lot 
like a peacock. And absolutely, I mean, these, these, uh, these signals and traits that these birds produce are, are stunningly gorgeous. And um, I, I don't know enough about them to say whether it's mostly males that are adorning themselves, but I believe, I believe that it is. Um, and so, yes, this is one case where there is a convergence on a shared aesthetic sense. Um, but as I said, there's also examples like the spotted bowerbird where, um, where it's not quite as obviously aesthetic to us as, as well. What is the theory about the peacock, uh, the female peacock looking at the Looking face? across the bottom? No uh, so why, why is the female only looking across the bottom? This was one of these results that's very exciting for us scientists where it, it almost raises as many questions as it answers. Um, we were stunned. We certainly didn't expect to find that result, and yet it just happened over and over and over again. Females are perfectly capable of looking up. It's not that the head here is holding their head down or anything like that. Um, they just simply don't very often. Um, so we're still trying to figure it out, but one thing that I think is very interesting, my student went to, uh, to India to look at the peafowl where they're naturally performing these displays, and she found that when she was trying to find a lek, she, uh, a lek or a, a gathering of displaying males, she almost always could only see the top parts of their tails. So that's what allowed her to find these males from a distance in order to go study them. And so it's possible that that upper region of the peacock's tail plays uh, an important role in long distance attraction. Um, it's, it's not entirely clear. And it could be that we also find that the visual physiology allows the female to gather information about the entire train, even while focusing her attention mostly on the bottom. So the next step is to do some experiments where she lops off various portions of the male's <laughs> tail uh, in order to see how that changes her mating decisions and how she assesses that train. One more. Well, well, if I may, um I actually saw this one time, you know, the, the peacocks doing this, but the male has these sexual organs and they were, it was very beautiful, they were just pulsing at the bottom of his tail, and it, I, I always remember this, and I'm, when you said this, is she actually, is it possible that she's looking at these, at his sexual organs? Uh, across the bottom of his train, you mean? It's, across it's the, their body, you know, where yeah. his, their fishtail feathers all the way across the bottom of his train. And she spends a lot of time, less, not as much time on the looking at the body as she does out on the edges of the train. Uh, he also has spurs on his legs, and she does spend a little bit of time looking at the spurs. Um, but uh, most of the time when she's out assessing males, she's not even looking at the male. 70% of the time, she's looking all around, <laughs> which, you know, these old Victorian guys that study birds like the sage grouse and the peacocks talked about these aggressive males and very coy females. And when I first read that, I thought, like everyone else, that this was just a bunch of sexist old Victorian men coming up with these terms. But when you're out looking at these, you can't help but come to that same set of terms. Most of the time, females aren't even looking at the male. They're looking all around. When he starts shimmering his train, her attention is grabbed. And that seems to hold her attention for a little while. Um, but then when she is looking at him, it's mostly the base just of the train itself. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you.